Greetings, fashion futurists. As promised, we've shifted our sartorial gaze across the Atlantic to New York to continue our fabulous adventures. This series, we're focusing on the business of fashion, taking a look at the glamorously titled back-end jobs. <laughs> Vital to keeping the industry afloat. Sorry to laugh, it's not funny. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the British Vogue YouTube channel or you might miss out. I moved to New York in 2009 to host an MTV chat show, basically, and inadvertently ended up becoming more involved in fashion just through living here. It's literally, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. The energy here is really high octane. People work until midnight and get up at five to go to the gym before they go to work again. I think it was just a bit of a shock when I got here that that was the way of life. Plus, I had no mates. It is somewhere where you can get things done. If you have an idea, someone else will help you realise that um, dream, as it were. If you come here and you're feeling a bit like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work, you can be buoyed up by people here because they're so enthusiastic and positive. Yeah, let's do it. You want to do a pants line? Fantastic. Everyone's so friendly here. I was like totally reading your feedback from series one and loads of people requested more of an insight into the business of fashion. So I thought, duh, we should totally go to New York. <clears throat> I mean, if London is all about the art and Paris is couture, New York City is surely all about the money, baby. Renowned for being a city of workaholics, it's one that has produced some of the most progressive minds the world of management, communications and retail has ever seen. We're kicking off in one of my favourite parts of town, Soho, where I frequently partake in one of my favourite pastimes, jogging. Sorry, I mean shopping. They're kind of the same thing, actually, but one's way more expensive. That's jogging, of course, because the accessories and nutrition bar derivatives are way out of control these days. Anyway, Lindsay Butler started her boutique leather store in 2008. She runs Veda from her studio, showroom and storefront in the heart of Soho, and somehow manages to juggle both running the business and leading the design team side by side. I'm pretty sure she hasn't slept since 2005. Hello. So what, what are people doing right now? They're making samples, and then actually I think that they're working on, we've been, we did these little uh, baby jackets. So I think we're making a few extra babies. You're doing baby leathers? Yeah, they're really cute. <laughs> That's pretty cute. Yeah. I feel like I might one day turn into a creepy weird lady that doesn't have any children, but just collects children's <laughs> clothes and strokes them at night, like one day. <laughs> Can you start by telling us what you think your job title is and how many you have? Because you, you have a lot of slashes going sure. on. Sure. I've sort of defined it more recently as like, I think I'm more like a creative director role and uh -huh. then definitely CEO. That's also a big one for me. But of course I do like, I do fittings, yeah. I do, I, I don't know, I feel like I do a little bit of everything. When you were younger, did you have a set goal? Did you think, oh, one day I want to be the CEO of my own company? I actually did. I really wanted to like own my own company. I did not know that it was a fashion company. I was just like, I want to be my own boss. That so was you, really important to me. You came from the business side and you, you, you yeah. definitely excelled in that. Because I read a quote from you in an interview where you were saying that so much of what you do encompasses so many different things. So you'll be doing uh, the creative, but also you'll be, you know, have your head in the middle of spreadsheets as well, which yeah. you actually might enjoy more. Yeah, I definitely like them both a lot, and I think I might enjoy the business side a little bit more. <laughs> what did you study at university? Um, philosophy and religion. So nice. Yeah. How does that play into what you do now? I think it helps with like thought processes and like how I process information and a lot of like studying philosophy is like basing your arguments on things. So yeah. I don't know how that helps exactly with work, but I feel like maybe it just like helps me organize my thoughts in a way. Just because this program is based on feedback and questions from the audience mm -hmm. that might be watching it. And uh, a lot of our comments were about how to parlay your degree into a job in the fashion industry. And people are concerned if they study uh, law or science or politics or whatever, that it right. won't be relevant to the industry. But uh, it absolutely is. I also think like a lot of like liberal arts degrees in general are just kind of like about teaching yourself like how to be diligent at doing work and mm -hmm. how, to, how to think and how to work with other people and sort of how to relate to the world. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's a lot of what I learned at school as well. Like just how to kind of be in the world on your own and yeah. things like that. You just have to want to work really hard and 
and pick up things as you go along. Because we were talking as well about whether business acumen is something that you can that can be learned or whether you think that's inherent to people and then they become successful business people. Gosh, I don't know. I kind of think it's a little bit of both. Like I feel like I'm good at it, so yeah. but I don't know if that's something that's like innate. I definitely learned things along the way. Like I'm still learning how to be a good boss and a manager and a leader. I feel mm -hmm. like it's all can be learned, but I think maybe for some people it's easier than other people. When can I buy this? Money. May. May, yep. This, this, <laughs> everything. <laughs> So brilliant. Dang. This is just the best thing ever. Yeah, that's really fun. How much is that going to be? I think like 300. How right? do you decide how much something should cost? So you have to kind of work backwards from what it actually costs to make. Right. And then you have to build in like a wholesale um, markup because you have to sell to the stores first. Yeah. And then they have to mark it up to retail at their kind of standard. Usually it's from wholesale to retail. It's like 2.2. And does your store price reflect that of like yeah, I, so I do the same retail price just to be considerate to right. my stores, but sometimes we'll make like one-off products or we have a small collection called the Mercer collection that uh -huh. we sell just in the store. And that is kind of for us a fun way to test new styles, but also to get in like a lower price point jacket because we can just make them and put them directly in the store. I see. And there's no middleman. You didn't have your store to begin with? No. Started okay. doing wholesale to begin with and then moved into retail. And how important do you think retail is now? Because I know that you have an yeah. iPad in your shop and people can still yeah. incorporate the e-commerce thing into it. So do you think it's still relevant to have a retail space? I do. I, I think I kind of went back and forth. Maybe like three years after I started the brand, I, had, I opened a store in Ludlow and mm -hmm. I had that for about a year and a half. I really wanted to have that touchstone with the customer. And I think for that reason alone, it's really important. Like I hear such awesome feedback from the store. Like, yeah. oh, the buckle on that jacket is like makes a lot of noise and people keep not buying it because the but like the buckles jingly and I was like is the music not loud enough in the store like why is that happening but I'm, that's not something I've ever heard from like a wholesale account but yeah. that's great we got a new buckle now so yeah. it won't happen anymore I don't think I would I think it would have taken a lot longer to like get that information do you have advice for anyone watching that wants to set up their own business something that you wish you'd been told before you embarked on this journey I think just in general, understanding that you kind of need to have both that creative side and a business acumen. Mm -hmm. It really, I mean, so if you don't have that, if you're just creative and you make beautiful things, like that's amazing. Find somebody that you can partner with that does have that. Um, I think, I think partnering, I think like mentors, I think asking questions and not thinking you know everything, like the sooner you can learn that, like I think the better off you'll be. So I think asking for help and finding the right people to work with is really important. And that, my dear foffers, is what a multitasking Wonder Woman looks like. As Lindsay says, the right help is key and a strong partnership can help build the foundations for enterprise. Joseph Altazara found the yin to his fashion yang with CEO Karis Derma after launching his eponymous women's wear line in 2008. The rest is beautiful history. I really felt that I had taken it as far as I could um, and that I needed a partner within the company to help me think about things differently, to help take it somewhere that I didn't feel I could take it on my own. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a long process trying to find that person. We really talked about the type of company that we wanted to create if we could work together and the environment that we thought was great. Joseph had a lot of experience working at different types of fashion companies and mm -hmm. had a really strong point of view. And I felt that, you know, he was very mature and very wise. And I don't uh, pretend to have every answer. I don't want to have every answer, but my job is to help Joseph um, build his team and then to build out the rest of the organization so that they can provide the answers and that the group as a collective can, can help sort of the best ideas rise to the top. When you're looking for new team members, what's been some of the harder roles to fill? Recently, we spent a long time looking for a merchandiser. Mm -hmm. And I think merchandising is a very important um, and sometimes overlooked role in, in an early stage of a company. What and do I, they do? Uh, what does a merchandiser a do? A merchandiser is able to sit with the design team understand what their needs are and the direction, not only of the brand, but of that specific season, and look at the creative director and know what's making him or her tick that season, mm -hmm. but at the same time, analytically understand 
where the company is trying to go in terms of the numbers, in terms of the breadth of the collection, key categorizations, and key price points. As we start launching the collection, then there's also a question about like, Okay, this fabric is like a really specific kind of dyeing process. So maybe we can do this and it's going to be expensive. But how about we think about a more, also a more commercial way of doing it? So mm. is it also about doing a digital print that looks like this, mm. but that could be less expensive? I would say to anybody that wants to be a CEO, um, to think about not only the things that people, you know, tell you in terms of strategy, brand building, et cetera, et cetera, but I really think you need to be aware of how much time you spend with people mm -hmm. and building your team, because that is really, I would say, 50% of what I do today. Um, I think in this specific industry, it's also having the awareness that you will work very closely with your creative director. You'll hold their hand every step of the way and they'll hold yours. And I think that CEOs in other industries um, don't have that partner sort of, you know, that is um, necessary for growing their business. And I'm particularly lucky uh, because Joseph is such a pleasure to work with, genuinely. Um, but understanding that as a CEO, you need to be sensitive to them and know how to work with them and understand what their habits and patterns and needs are uh, because that's critical. Otherwise, you won't be successful as a brand. Excellent. Super lucky. Oh, guys, <laughs> not now. That's true. <laughs> So as you can see, there's really no cut and dried way to structure a managerial system within a fashion brand. It's a complex world out there, but I'm learning it's very much about finding people who complement each other's skill sets. That way, everyone can bring something to the table to create one big, beautiful fashion pie. It's sort of like free love, but with, you know, hemlines and spreadsheets instead of LSD and cuddle parties. But I digress. Our final meeting is with perhaps the poster children of progressive retail presentations. Umberto Leon and Carol Lim launched opening ceremony in 2002 with a manifesto to combine their passion for art, travel and fashion. Once a tiny store in downtown New York, they've now gone global and their conceptual scope is ever shifting and always innovative. Also probably worth a mention, in their spare time, the duo have led French fashion house Kenzo to dizzying new heights since taking on creative director roles. Their unrelenting ingenuity and success almost makes you want to hate them. Oh, shit. But to make matters worse, they're also really nice people. Hello. Hi. I guess we're just going to have to roll with it and join the loving. That's amazing. OK. Thanks, guys. Sometimes I think they think I'm shoplifting in here. Come. <laughs> they do. I bet they do. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Carol and I actually met at university at, uni at UC Berkeley mm -hmm. when we were 18 and um, I studied art. Carol. I studied economics. Perfect. <laughs> we met, I actually worked at retail for 14 years, for wow. a long time before um, we got into this and then I got recruited into corporate and I worked for The Gap and then I ended up working for Burberry when they were rebranding. Wow. I knew that banking and kind of finance wasn't for me and so uh -huh. I was like, I want to live in New York. So I was like, why not try fashion? And it took me actually a while because everywhere I interviewed, they're like, what do you do? Like, <laughs> what's M&A? And you know, I had to kind of explain what I knew how to do and yeah. then a year and a half later, I started opening ceremonies, so. So can you list some of the jobs that exist in order to make this thing run? I think people might need to know that there's like yeah. a PR situation, a lawyer, a da da da. Let's yeah. do it. Uh, <laughs> this okay. Is, Carol should wrap this thing. You can wrap it. Well, like I think in my world for our opening ceremony, I oversee a lot of what the people call the back office function. So, from finance, legal, IT, HR, logistics. Um, then there's like the retail operations and the e-commerce operations. There's merchandising and buying. And then from my end, there's <laughs> the designing, the art department, visual merchandising. Special projects. Special projects, graphic designers, um, content team for web and social media, 
All in all, it's a pretty big brand. That's a lot of, that's a lot of birthdays to keep up with. It's yeah, a lot it of is. birthdays, a lot of a celebrating. Lot of but it actually, it's a good question because I think there's a lot in fashion that it's not just the creative side. Uh -huh. There's a lot of other pieces that you absolutely need because you could have all the things like amazing ideas and then something legal could be like, oh, well, you just can't do that idea. Mm -hmm. So I think having that you know, connection with all those different areas is important. Well, what's interesting is a lot of people that come to us, they come from a non-fashion field, but right. they're professionals and as lawyers and things, and they'll come to a talk that we did and they'll say, hey, how do I work in fashion? And we said, there is a job for you in fashion. Right. You just have to find the right place. Exactly. I'm always amazed as well by how cool all the staff are here <laughs> and that the shop assistants are like really up on everything. How, what's the interview process for finding those people? Well, we <laughs> generally don't ask them about clothes. We really? start off with, what's your favorite bands? What yeah. movies do you love? Nice. It's a little bit more of a nerdy interview, and I think everyone that interviews with us always is shocked. Oh yeah, they get really stumped, because they're like, oh, my god. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, like, because we always say, what's sweating, the... there's yeah. a lot of crazy. Has anyone yeah. ever cried when you're interviewing them? Definitely, yeah. no. a lot of crying, panting, needs 15 minute break. They, that's because interview. you're hiring children babies. <laughs> you're just hiring toddlers. Just it's because we babies. ask people these personal questions, like name your three favorite bands. And oh, then that is are the like, worst question though, when you're not prepared for it. Because exactly. so, like, you can think about that all day long and suddenly you're like, and then you come out with something like Nirvana, and you're like, oh yeah. man. Why? And then we get follow up emails saying, I said that, but actually you know yeah, what I exactly. wanted to say. But is... That's good, that's when you know you've got someone that really cares about getting this job. Yeah. yeah. Which is the other thing. But then just you... curious people that I think have, uh, they want to know and learn things, mm -hmm. and I think that translates really well. Can you talk to me as well about this retail space and how important it is to have kind of bricks and mortar and how that's changed as well since you've started? For us, it's a really great way for people to experience the stories we're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, you know, online, you don't really physically get to touch things. So yeah. for us, there's something really, really nice about being able to tell the story of the designers that we carry. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's really about the experience. What's interesting is I feel like people use opening ceremony also as a meeting point. Mm -hmm. So it's also for us what we kind of can almost see it like as a square where people would meet. I mean, opening ceremony, you see it on the weekends always. People are yeah. meeting here. It's a marketplace. Yeah. yeah. Let's meet by the potato. They're talking and then they'll look at some clothes here and there and they'll buy or they'll not buy. And yeah. I think that's how we've really been able to make this also a family store because parents will come in super excited about something that we're launching, bring their kids in or the kids will bring their parents in. And yeah. To us, that's really exciting. I don't, there's not too many stores in fashion that focus on families. I think it's nice that we can be part of that community and be a, a place for these people yeah. in that way. I feel like we're interviewing a lot of uh, people in this New York episode, but we were trying to find female CEOs to talk about. And it, there seems to be an imbalance in that world. There seems to be a male-dominated profession. How do you think that impacts the industry? And do you think it's changing as well? It definitely impacts the industry. And whether it's changing or not, I think it's a deeply rooted, I think, systemic thing that starts pretty early on, I think, mm -hmm. with, you know, saying, are these jobs even available? I don't know if girls are even taught, like, oh, these are things you can aspire to. And I do think that, you know, it needs to change, but a lot of it has to do with awareness. So it is about talking about it and creating those paths for women. Yeah. Well, this might be inspiring for people that are watching you. Good. Uh, that's we a good I hope so, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> PR, or public relations in layman's terms, is a highly competitive industry where only those with the improbable combination of quick wit, organizational skills, and charm will survive. One of New York's most progressive PR agencies, Black Frame, is spread over several floors in the Chelsea Arts District, where a squadron of staff look after clients that range from Kenzo to Nike to the Freeze Art Fair. We have the only. Yeah. And there's a pretty wonderful showroom on the second floor, too. Of course, Kirkwood. Shoeland. Okay, let's go for this. Does it smell of Swifty? Doesn't it? It stinks of Taylor Swift. <laughs> it smells like angels' oh, hair. <laughs> Along with curating an extensive catalogue of celebrity pheromones, Chief Executive Brian Phillips combines his expertise in the areas of fashion, film and art to lead a PR firm that tends to some of fashion's most inventive brands. 
can you just talk us through how you got to this point? Like, what did sure. you study at university? I know that you went to college with Umberto, right? Well, I met him when I was in college. Oh, okay. He, he had already graduated. Nice. I was here at Columbia University mm -hmm. studying architecture and urban studies, which I was interested in being an architect, but famously not good at drawing at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved magazines, so that was kind of my side gig. Okay, so from once you graduated, what was your first uh, job? I worked at Visionaire. I love this idea of art and fashion existing in a publication together mm -hmm. and how they were pushing the boundaries of making magazines. And I also loved the idea of kind of being in that kind of a creative environment, getting to know what it was to make a magazine. Yeah. So that's where I, that's where I started. And do you think that, that editorial eye kind of bleeds into what you do today? Yeah, the idea of putting together a kind of perspective on some aspect of the cultural industry or of, of fashion is something that has been for sure put into play here because yeah. we, you know, we have a brand too. You know, clients want to be a part of this context because it says something about who they are and what mm -hmm. their values are. And so can you explain to me what your business is now and how you got started? Well, our main business is public relations and image consulting. So we represent clients from fashion like Rodarte and Kenzo and opening ceremony to art and design related projects like Freeze Art Fair, Standard Hotels. So it kind of cuts across all mm -hmm. these different sectors of what like-minded people might be interested in. When we represent a brand, it's a kind of 360 look at everything that they're doing. So it's the way that they're advertising themselves, the way that they're dressing cool girls and guys, mm -hmm. relationships with editors and magazines and writers. You know, we're their ambassador to yeah. the world in a way. And yeah. find a way of doing that in interesting and unconventional ways sometimes. Can you give us an example of how you've managed to um, kind of put those things together? Well, with opening ceremony, um, a big project that they did last year was this development of the Mika bracelet mm -hmm. with Intel. So that was a really interesting foray into wearable tech. When we were challenged here at Black Frame, how to sort of visualize that and make it compelling as a, as a desirable object mm -hmm. uh, that would blend fashion and wearable tech. Kenzo is a great brand that can really have an authentic voice in independent film storytelling. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we've kind of been spearheading for, for the brand. And that's a relatively new situation, isn't it? Absolutely. So it's no longer a kind of reality show version of a photo shoot. It can have its own identity entirely. Absolutely. You know, people love music, they love film. And or, cats, people love cats. People love cats. Oh of course, that's <laughs> the other thing. Um, fashion cats are huge. The last opening ceremony show that I went to, mm -hmm. when it was models walking along, and then some of them would fall, like yeah, one would fall down. They were falling the down. first girl that fell down, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and I was with everyone, and we were all sitting there going, oh, poor girl, that is really embarrassing. We kept talking about it, we we're like, that is so embarrassing. And then suddenly another one, and I was like, oh, it's a thing. And then they got up and did a dance, and I was like, this is amazing. Yeah, that was like, let's, you know, turn the sort of. Um, conventions of a show, mm -hmm. one of which is, sadly, there's sometimes Some falls, yeah. <laughs> into something that surprises people yeah. and makes it memorable. And opening ceremonies like the best laboratory because they always say yes to the really big and crazy ideas. Yeah, that was brilliant though. Where do you see uh, the future of image making going? What's going to happen? Soothsayer. Yeah. I mean, photography and fashion are so inextricable and have yeah. been since like Abaddon and, and Irving Penn. I think fashion is also looking at other types of image creators, and that could be, you know, young illustrators or architects. Anybody who can create something that's compelling from yeah. a fashion point of view um, as an image maker is going to be doing well in the future. Our mission to uncover the real future of fashion has taken us down some pretty oblique pathways. But art collective turned brand consultants K-Hole take the abstraction cake with their highly conceptual approach to trend definition and cultural observation. But how does this relate to fashion, I hear you cry? Don't worry, I'm confused too. 
In a further twist of elusive genius, they don't even have an IRL base. So I had the FOF art director fabricate a typical NYC creative space so that we could meet to discuss their delvings into the netherworld of speculative sartorialism. Hello. Hi. Hi. Only balls up was I forgot to pack my dictionary. OK. Here we are for our set up meeting. I hate anything that's not authentic and therefore I can't act. <laughs> but I can be. <laughs> I honestly can't. Five years ago, we started an artist project slash uh, art collective called K-Hole mm -hmm. with interest in opening up and activating a space between the art world and the world of branding and marketing. We had all graduated from school and we were living this space between being artists and writers and poets and also doing all these commercial jobs for money. So a friend of ours worked at an agency where they subscribe to these really expensive trend forecasting reports yeah. where you pay as a company, let's say 20K a year and you get these PDFs with emoticons in them that have all sorts of pop cultural theory about young people. And we became obsessed with these reports <laughs> and basically in the spirit of fan fiction started K-Hole. Part of the reason we decided to make a PDF and not a print product is because it was low overhead. Mm -hmm. So we were paying for it out of our own pockets, but it really wasn't very expensive. It was just our time. And of course, as things go on, your time gets more and more expensive right. and you have to adjust in different ways. And then for us to get an understanding of how your business runs, like how many do you have an office? Now we're basically in a Google Doc and on the cloud. Okay. And how many people make up your collective? There are five of us. Okay. So it's like a band. <laughs> um, and we were kind of intentionally mysterious about who we were because mm -hmm. uh, we were nobody. And the world of the internet started to take us seriously as not just an art project, but also as a marketing and trend consultancy. But you never set out to be taken seriously. It was more kind of a critique on that. And then you ended up actually it being a profitable business. It wasn't a satire. Like on purpose, it wasn't like ad busters or something mm -hmm. that had come before in the 90s. We were trying to demonstrate a much more ambivalent relationship with commerce and culture. And mm -hmm. we were also trying to push our friends who were artists who were pretending like their lives as consumers were somehow completely separate from their art practice. Right. And that's kind of where we started from. But also sort of looking at the actual language and landscape of trend forecasting, a lot of it seems like super lightweight cultural analysis. Yeah. Like observing something in the most basic way possible and calling it a trend. And we thought it would be a really interesting opportunity to actually sort of use the analytics skills that we had built as writers and artists to take sort of surface looking things and figure out what was really sort of emotionally motivating about them. Can you tell us about your involvement with Normcore? Sure. For us, it didn't really have to do with clothes, but more had to do with imagining a new form of coolness mm -hmm. that was about being as slippery and adaptable as possible and allowing you to get down with as many different groups of people and types of people as possible. I love being as slippery as possible. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps that Loom me up. Perhaps that is literally as slippery as possible. But, you know, we were asked to create a report for the occasion of the marathon at the Serpentine in London during the Freeze Art Fair in 2013. They asked us to think about the question of generation branding and if you could create a new generation after millennials, Generation X, is it Generation Z? Is it right. the me generation? Whatever, there are all these I've different... I've been in meetings about that. Oh, oh yeah. people love having meetings about it. So we honed in on this cliche that millennials all think they're so special, which you may have heard. And Wait, are they not? <laughs> and it occurred to us that maybe all of society was worried about how special they were. So we started to reflect on what that actually meant and how you could get out of this idea that you had to enforce your coolness or specialness against other people stealing it, which we looked at as a kind of alternative mm -hmm. perspective. And we decided that we were in this mass indie scenario where being special and expressing your creativity was the mainstream value. So we kind of came up with these two different routes for how you might react to being in this mass indie scenario. The first one was the idea that you just try to opt out of it by being as bland and basic as humanly possible, <laughs> uh, which we in our report call acting basic. This idea that you can kind of be as simple as possible and that'll somehow get you out of the quandary just doesn't seem to work at all. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we started to dream of Normcore. We presented this report at the Serpentine and it 
kind of bounced around on Twitter and in the art world. We kind of didn't take it very seriously. We were sort of like, ah, oh, that's not really what we meant, but yeah. who cares? That's fine. Like right. the idea with us coming up with new languages for people to use it themselves. So our perspective wasn't that we should police people's use of our language. Mm -hmm. And it turned out being a mega meme. And it was really <laughs> insane. Um, Why do you think the fashion industry was so quick to drink in your PDFs and why were they so attracted to you? I think most of it has to do with the fact that it was a, sort of revolved around a neologism. Like just the fact that all of the- I this, don't know what that word means. It means a new word. No word. idea. An I'm invented like, word. An invented word. <laughs> so something like normal. And uh, I think the reach of that word, again, it has a very sort of linguistic backing. You can, it's a word that doesn't mean anything like core from hardcore, mm -hmm. meaning the sort of extreme behavior, norm meaning normal, like it defeats itself in its own sort of linguistic existence. People needed more vocabulary for fashion. And that's true. There weren't that many new words or ways to describe the way people were dressing. Fabulous. Besides fabulous. <laughs> Darling. Um, <laughs> so I think that was part of it. Hipster. The idea of the hipster had been totally exhausted, but in my opinion, part of the reason that went on so long, this question of, oh, hipsters think they're different, but they're actually the same, is because there were no new words to yeah. talk about kind of what it means to dress in a certain way or have personal style or think of yourself as cool. So I think we came into a vacuum in a certain way. Have you invented any words that have reached the dictionary? Well, Normcore was the Oxford English Dictionary's word of was the year runner-up. Runner oh, up. oh, okay. We lost to vape. Tied with bay. Wow. It was, <laughs> it was, a, big, it was a big blow. <laughs> I'm asked about trends a lot, and I don't think they exist. Well, I think that you can connect certain dots and make a bet on what you think is going to snowball and become bigger and mm. bigger. Okay, so what's the thing? What's the next thing? I'm sure we can no. figure it out. Oh, man. I think it's really big sleeves. Really big. Really big sleeves. Really big sleeves. Mm, I feel like really big sleeves is here. No, really big ones. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. Just two decades ago, no one would have prophesied that stylists, makeup artists, and hairdressers toiling away behind the scenes of fashion shows, red carpets, and photo shoots would become celebrities in their own right. Hello. Hi. Apart from Brooke Wall, that is, who spotted early on that the industry's best stylists and technicians were underrepresented, despite their hugely powerful role curating the looks of the world's most revered celebrities and models. Give me a tour, please. Okay, great. What are these and these say? are, that says closers. Because that's the deal makers. Closers, they're closing the deal. Oh Getting it done. After a few years learning on the job, Brooke set up her own agency, The Wall Group, in 1999, which has since evolved in perfect harmony with the ever-changing landscapes of fashion and beauty. A fantastic role model for any aspiring businesswoman and an oracle for anyone wanting to pursue a career in the styling or beauty industries, it's rather amusing to learn that the whole thing started because she had a serious crush on a hairdresser. I mean, Brooke! I went to London and I studied hair just as an excuse to get to know him. Who is it? <laughs> I'm not telling you. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> so can you explain to us what The Wall Group is? The Wall Group is an agency that represents talent within the entertainment and fashion industry, such as hairstylists, makeup artists, wardrobe stylists, fashion stylists, set designers, manicurists. So everyone who's sort of behind the scenes. Magic um, elves that make something look beautiful. Yeah, the little sort of <laughs> fairies that run around behind the scenes and sort of sprinkle stuff all over people. Uh, we represent those individuals. So before you set this up, what was your experience of the fashion industry? Were you, were you hoping to be a stylist yourself or a makeup artist? Okay. I was always attracted to fashion. When I was in my teens in Canada, they would ask me if I would model. I did that once and I said, this isn't for me. <laughs> there are certain people that are in front of the camera people mm -hmm. and there are certain people that are behind the camera. And I felt very comfortable behind kind of orchestrating and being the puppeteer of making things happen. So right. I, I recognized that very early. And then when I came to New York, I thought, well, you know what would be fun if I just went and worked with 
Hey, that guy Orbe, he has like a little fun salon and he works with like Christy and Naomi and Linda and Kate and all those girls mm -hmm. in the 90s and I'm just going to go and I'll work with him and help him. So I went in, I had wet hair, I wore it under a hat and Orbe looked at me and said, anyone who has the balls to come for an interview with wet hair is hired. Wow. So he hired me on the spot and um, just got to know everyone and through that Katie Ford approached me. She said, just start an agency. So I did. You were one of the first people to realize the star power that these talents behind the scenes had in their own right. So how did you first spot that maybe a stylist or a makeup artist could become their own brand almost? I noticed that celebrities were starting to become more and more prolific on the cover of magazines. And, you know, with a talent, I kind of felt like connecting them with that world could elevate them mm. equally. These people are celebrities within themselves. Yeah. Equal to a lot of people that are out there in their field, like as an expert in their field. Can you talk to us about the ways in which your business has evolved to respond to the way that uh, the tech world has been incorporated into the fashion industry? Yeah, everybody has always said I'm a little crazy. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> and when Twitter first launched, I bought every Twitter book they had on social media and right. I ran around the office and I put it on all the agents desks and I said you have to read this cover to cover you have to understand this it is everything it's the future of this industry you have to and they were all like what is she talking about? how did you get that idea though how did you know that that was because be because such a when huge thing? I started the question on the phone about the artists was how many fashion shows have they done within probably four years of opening, the question started, what celebrities have they worked with? Right. Now it's how many followers do they have? Wow. So I've kind of always been aware that mm -hmm. the business is going to shift. Clearly a natural born innovator, Brooke has never been one to settle for the status quo. Dissatisfied by the monotony of promoting her talent's work on the news pages of her website, she ripped the blog down and replaced it with The Thick, an online magazine filled with juicy news and views from industry insiders. Can we talk about The Thick and yeah. what that is? And I can tell you exactly what it is. Tell us what it is. <laughs> the Thick is a very tongue-in-cheek, fun sort of insider in the thick of the industry, having all the information. As they say, telefax, telephone, telehairdresser, that's how you get a message around New York. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it really, they, there's a lot of information, but it's a celebration platform of everybody who is not celebrated in the industry, and then some who are. Mm -hmm. It's for our talent to display who they are to clients as well from a personal perspective, yeah. rather than just looking through portfolios, looking through Instagram, looking through traditional channels. It's in place for them to just tell a little story in two, three minutes. For me, at least, when I'm working with makeup artists or hairstylists, I'd say it's like 70% personality, 30% talent. Totally. Is what I'm looking for. Exactly. It's like, can I stand with you right. for a week? Right. In this industry as an artist, you are working with a group of people to create something and you have to be a person that people want to hang out with all day mm -hmm. and have fun with. And I think personality is so important, so important. I mean, I love a fanatical talent that can do something perfectly, but I also am realistic in knowing that you have to be human first. Yeah, I think that's good advice for people. What about um, someone that was an a young entrepreneur and that was thinking of setting up their own business, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. are there some kind of guidelines you could give them or tidbits of advice that you wish you'd have known before starting your own company? <laughs> Maybe not do it. Uh, <laughs> no. You know, for me, I recognized pretty young something. There was a, I had an epiphany and I felt like by the time I was 23, you know what, I think I'm going to own my own business. I'm going to employ a lot of people. And I'm going to make all my own decisions by the time I'm 42. That's what's gonna happen for me. Never thought about it again. Continued struggling through my 20s, wondering, you know, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna, you know, 27 I woke up, I said, you know what, it doesn't really matter if I'm a janitor. As long as I do a great job at being a janitor, something will fall into place. The right thing's gonna to come to me. So Once, there I was, mopping floors. <laughs> there I was, and it struck me. <laughs> it just works that way. But you have to have a gut feeling if you're an entrepreneur. 
Mm -hmm. You have to know that you have that gene and you have to be tough as nails mm -hmm. and be able to withstand a lot of hits. I feel like not everybody's meant for that particular job, yeah. you know, or responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. It's 24-7. It never shuts off. Um, and you are, you're, you're responsible for people's livelihoods. It's yeah. not just an accessory. It's not a handbag to have your uh, own a business. It's a huge responsibility. If you feel you want a leadership role, then I think you have to be very, very diligent. I think you have to be super smart. I think you have to study that role inside and out and understand everything about it. And you will get that. You will get that role. On we travel uptown and away from the shop fronts and into a neighborhood known for its higher education institutions to meet another incredible woman who spotted a gaping hole in the ultra sheer denier for the fashion industry stocking and admirably dove in headfirst to darn it up. Do you watch these things in the edit? Like this, for example, will someone have to watch, watch that? This, even me saying this, they having to transcribe this as we speak. Oh. Ta da! <laughs> Hello! Welcome. Hi, I'm lovely so to meet you. Here. Susan Scafidi, lover of frocks and professor of law, founded the Fashion Law Institute at the Fordham Law School in New York City, despite a distinctive lack of support from her male colleagues. Since then, she has advocated tirelessly for recognition of the need for a distinct fashion law, running the US's only and very oversubscribed fashion law course, and generally kicking conceptual butt in the murky field of copyright law. Which is the original and which is the knockoff? Very good, okay. I asked, okay. I asked this question um, over a period of a year and a half to everyone who wandered into my office, completely unscientific, but it was This is the original and this is the ripoff. Of course it is. Uh, you would know that, but <laughs> only about 75% of people got it right. Well, it was the finishing but that the, really gave it yeah, away. the finishing, the quality fabric. of the fabric. Is there not a rule where it's like, if seven things are different, it's no, okay. No, that's the, that's the biggest urban legend okay. in fashion and so copyright law. So what is the law, copyright So law. In, in the US, this is legal. You don't have to change a stitch. Wow. Um, a long time ago, over 100 years ago, the US Copyright Office decided that fashion, even the most elaborate fanciful fashion, was merely functional and therefore couldn't be protected but if it's produced, as a work of art. If it's produced in the US under this law, but sold overseas where a different law is in place, do you then fall into the problem? It depends of... where it's first created and produced. Okay. So this, because it was first produced in Europe, is protected in okay. Europe. Okay. But if it had first been produced in the US and then it was copied in Europe, no such luck. Ten years ago, there was no such legal field as fashion law. Yeah. And I'd tried for a long time at different institutions uh, to, to get permission to teach such a thing. And finally, Fordham decided to take a chance on it. And so we created a course here as part of the Fordham Law School curriculum. The idea was that it should be a resource for the industry. So five years after that, Dion von Furstenberg and the Council of Fashion Designers of America helped us create an institute, which is a separate nonprofit. Uh -huh. And we have a number of courses that we run inside of Fordham inside of the curriculum and we have a research program and we have public events and we have a clinic for designers who have no money and no clue and nowhere to go. How um, was it that it didn't exist 10 years ago? Was it not needed? Fashion houses, designers, models, etc. have always co uh, communicated with lawyers and consulted lawyers yeah. but there was no formal training for those lawyers and okay. so they had to sort of back into it and learn on their own. Yeah. Uh, and I think in part because this was the neglected industry. It is, as it is in Britain, the second largest industry in New York City mm -hmm. and yet there was no field of law to support it. And actually, my senior colleagues at another institution refused to let me work on it. They said, you can't write about fashion. It's too girly. It's too frivolous. No one will take you seriously. Uh, and I thought, it's a $1.8 trillion industry globally, approximately, give or take a trillion, right? They said, also a trillion said no. between friends. <laughs> Precisely. And so I proposed fashion law. And my poor associate dean, had no idea what to say, just silent. One wonderful colleague said, well, we have sports law. We have two sections of sports law. Isn't fashion law just sports law for girls? I thought, well, <laughs> it's support. I'll take it where I can get it. The associate dean said to me, you know, if, if Susan, if we don't get at least three students, I have to cancel the class. I said, okay. So seven o'clock in the morning, registration opened. 7.03, the course is full. 7.05, I get the first email. Professor, is, the, is the, the registration link broken? I can't get into your class. We had to double the size of the class, and that was 10 years ago and it went from there. Amazing. So you trained to be a lawyer. I did. Did you always have in mind that you would like to apply that skill set to the fashion industry Absolutely or did it sort not. of unfold? 
<laughs> no, it most definitely unfolded. You know, I have my deep family roots in fashion, but never thought that fashion was something I could do professionally. Yeah. In fact, I studied legal history and was planning to be a legal historian. I studied me medieval ecclesiastical law of all things. I can't even like say that, let alone spell it. <laughs> I'm not sure I can anymore either. Uh, but what, what happened was I was teaching intellectual property. Okay. And things like the video you're filming have extensive intellectual property protection, very harmonized all over the world. For your life plus 70 years, no one can copy this without your permission. Really? Or, or, <laughs> there you go. And le unless the copyright belongs to, to Vogue, which is a, a slightly I different story. I think that was in the contract but... at some point. I was <laughs> fighting for owning this concept. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and as well you should. Uh, but the protection of fashion is remarkably unharmonized. So we can go to country, from country to country and film and literature and works of quote unquote fine art are protected. But fashion is, is not, or at least not in many places and certainly not in the US. On the, sitting on the, on the desk is a law that we helped pass, actually. A framed thing with the blue ribbons oh, yeah. is a, a law to protect child models. Uh, in New York. Oh, really? Because all kinds of child performers had, had protections. So child actors and dancers and musicians had lots of protections with regard to the hours they worked and, and chaperones and percentage of, of what they were paid until they were of age and that sort of thing. And models specifically had no protection. Wow. And so we helped create an organization called the Model Alliance to... Yes, um, there is it. Amazing. Yeah. I was on my own and I didn't know how to stand up for myself. Unfortunately, because even the youngest models routinely work unchaperoned, abuse of this kind is common. That is one of the mm -hmm. jobs where you're rinsed the most in terms of being like a child that's working, but also yes. giving your agent 20% and, and the client. And the client yeah. having to pay another 20% on top of so, that. So they take 40% from there's, you. Exactly. There's a lot, well, you know better than anyone. There's Sucks. a lot of exploitation in that industry. Sucks. Yeah, it's amazing. Do you have any helpful hints to say you were a designer and you're setting up your own label. Are there a few key legal notes you could give someone that oh. would help them avoid a world of trouble? I'm, I'm so glad you asked. Well, uh, in speaking with young designers or design students, the first thing I say is please don't put your name on the label or at least think twice. When you put your name on the label and you trademark that name, it becomes a corporate asset. Mm. And so if at some point you take on an investor and then somewhere down the line part company with that investor, your name goes with your investor and you have to walk nameless into the night. Yeah. And that's kind of That painful. happens a lot. It does happen a lot. For for people that are watching this um, who are like, oh, fashion law seems amazing, I'd love to get into that, but don't necessarily have the access to a local uh, degree in that area, what else could they do to potentially end up working in this arena? So at this point, we are the only degree program in the world. So move to New York. Courses, isn't that? So move to New York is one option. but. As a, short, as a short version of that, we run a two-week boot, boot camp, and we do it every year, and people come from literally all over the world. And it's, it's lawyers and law students and fashion professionals, which is really cool. Yeah. But if you can't make it to class, you can always read, and you should. Um, and, and continue to educate yourself. And if you actually want to practice in the area, uh, then you need to, to learn everything you possibly can about the business of fashion and then about the law and work to put them together. It seems wild that as little as 10 years ago, someone might consider it girly and frivolous to like uh, take yeah. fashion law seriously? I, for a while, I thought it had a question mark at the end of it because no one ever said fashion law. They said fashion law. <laughs> <laughs> and it was always like that. In the last series, I saw a couple of comments where they thought we were being disparaging about bloggers. And I actually must admit that I felt very threatened by the blogging community when they first appeared on the scene, because suddenly they were sitting front row at Fashion Week and as a highbrow it girl. <laughs> no, but everyone was like, what are they? What are they doing? And I think people were really scared of them because they had so much power suddenly and so quickly. Four years ago, today exactly, actually, I started a fashion blog called Style Rookie. The rise of the blogger is arguably one of the most disruptive fashion innovations of the past decade. In the early to mid-2000s, driven by the magical combination of easy online publishing and inexpensive digital photography, a handful of fashion fanatics across the world began to publish online diaries featuring candid clothing reviews, emotive style musings, and wonderfully naive DIY fashion shoots. Carefully, guys, um, this is Brian, and I'm 17. Early pioneers included Patricia Hanscheidel's Style Diary, the ever-exuberant Brian Boy, 
London's finest Susie Bubble, Queen of Chic Garance Doré, and kooky 11-year-old Tavi Gevinson of Style Rookie, who floored the competition with her pre-teen take on high fashion. Kim Gordon, Jason Schwartzman, Kirsten Dunn. Hi. Don't you guys have that, like, horror movie club or something? Yeah. A new form of fashion media was born, and the most meticulously managed and regularly updated of these blogs swiftly built a loyal fan base of viewers. As far as the industry was concerned, this democratic movement whisked the rug right out from under their feet. As if from nowhere, these hugely influential blogging behemoths appeared, selectively reviewing and publicizing fashion products, free from the constraints of traditional advertising-funded journalism. This is a Natalia Brilli clutch, which somebody mistook for a dog earlier on. <laughs> they brought a, 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 a dish of water. It was a waiter at a, at a cafe. Story of the day. Great moments pass as Brian Boy gets a bag in his namesake, designed by his hero, Mark Jacobs. Alexander Wang and Rodarte dedicate their front row to blogging's finest, Emily Weiss launches into the gloss, and Tavi enrages numerous fashion journalists with her view-blocking headgear of gargantuan proportions. As fashion weeks come and go, bloggers fill the front row ranks, and a new fast-paced, low-budget, unfiltered, and highly personal journalism becomes the norm. Images flow freely and instantly from catwalk to a global online audience, and the way we experience fashion changes forever. Moving into 2012 or so, there's a second wave post-blog environment. The cat is well and truly out of the bag, and the internet is flooded with fashion blogs. It's a case of survival of the fittest, and only the superior specimens survive. Instagram arrives, and selfie cameras elevate narcissistic tendencies to a whole new level. But it's not all bad news. In an age of oversaturation, simply posting a picture of your cute outfit in page boy Bob just doesn't cut the mustard. To be relevant, you've got to have a voice, and more importantly, something to say. I want to talk to you guys about sustainable fashion consumption. And the most successful bloggers mobilize their influence, branching out into activism, design, podcasting, and more. It's come a long way from where it all started. I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> we are on our way to interview Leandra, who started a blog called Man Repeller, which is hugely popular. There are millions of followers on Instagram. I don't know how you measure success in blogs, but I imagine lots of sign-ups, traffics. We'll ask her. Have you heard of Man Repeller? Oh, I have no idea. What's which one? It's like this blog. Do you go on blogs? Do you know what a blog is? Blog? I have no idea. Sorry. It's like writing in a diary and then giving it out to a million people. Mm. She's called Leandra. Have you heard of her? Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi, sorry, a bit late. How's it going? You look nice. Hi. Where's your skirt from? Top shop. I mean, top shop. Top shop. Man Repeller started as a college project, authored by journalist in training Leandra Medin, whose self deprecating comedic fashion focused commentary hit a real chord with women all over the US and beyond. So, this is typically what an editorial meeting looks like, Alexa. Thanks. Over a period of six years since the blog was conceived, she's won awards, topped a multitude of power lists, published a book, and has developed Man Repeller into one of the most respected voices in the industry. That's do you have a idea. no idea is a bad idea policy in this room? A no idea is a bad idea? Yeah. No, that we do not have that policy. What we have learned is that many ideas are bad ideas. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, she's got the cream of the crop of young women queuing up for a job in the NoHo office as she forges crunchy, colorful new paths in fashion publishing. So this is a resume that we just received for someone who'd like to intern at Man Repeller this summer. Oh my god, how amazing. So that instead of ingredients, she's got language proficiency, Spanish 100, English 100%, French 50%. How cute. Oh, she calls us Fruit Loops in a world of Cheerios. That's why she chose Fruit Loops. Oh, I'm teary-eyed. I'm literally teary-eyed. What did you study at university? I went to school for journalism, and I started Man Repeller when I was a junior um, to hand in with my resume when I applied for jobs at New York Magazine and The New Yorker, because mm -hmm. those were the two places I wanted to work. But what, what came before Man Repeller? Were there any other blogs out there? I had a blog before Man Repeller. And yeah, go on, tell everyone what it was called. Boogers and Bagels. Real nice. The byline was, just kidding, this has nothing to do with bagels. <laughs> and how did you come up with the name Man repeller, and how bored are you of that question? Well, no, I'm actually not bored of that question because every time I 
every time I'm asked it, I get to answer it, and every time I answer it, it gets a little bit spicier. Like I start, oh. pep you know, peppering new details. Lying, in. basically. Not lying. <laughs> I was broken up with my husband at the time, and he wasn't my husband yet. He was just okay. an ex-boyfriend. Right. And I was also dating another guy and another guy. Yeah. Wait, were you doing that New Yorker thing where you can date multiple people without At one time? Well, I thought I was. I felt so cool. I was like riding this high horse and I'm like, look at me, I'm dating three guys <laughs> at once. Each and every one of them is obsessed with me. And then I had this realization that none of them actually liked me because <laughs> I was still single. And it's Saturday night and I'm watching a movie with my mom. Mm -hmm. So that's how you came up with Man Repeller? So I was complaining to my friend about this while we were at Topshop, and she was like, why are you so surprised? Look at all the clothing you're about to try on. And I was like, oh. And then we went into the dressing room, and I took off my pants, and she's like, when's the last time you got a bikini wax? <laughs> and I was like, ah. And that's how Man Repeller was born. So do you think you have to have a bikini wax to get a boyfriend? No, but I don't <laughs> think it's unhelpful if you want to have a boyfriend who's going to pleasure you with his mouth. Right. I'm sorry I said that. That's okay. It's probably not going to make the cut. <laughs> it's hard for one to remember and cast your mind back to a moment before Man Repeller existed mm -hmm. and that terminology was bandied around. Did that phrase exist before you made it a thing? No, I, the phrase did not exist, but I think that man repelling, which is essentially dressing for yourself, regardless mm -hmm. of what that means, is a social condition that has, has existed in fashion since its establishment. It gained traction really, really fast. I think partially because I was very active on Twitter, and I think as a result of that, a couple of editors at places like Refinery29 and Fashionista and the New York Daily News yeah. were following me. And so when I started posting links to articles, they would see them and then write about them on their So you were giving them content for free, basically? Sort of basically. And they'd be like, oh, look at this funny new website. It's called Man Repeller. And okay. then Refinery picked it up. And then the New York Daily News reached out. And then six months after I started, the New York Times profiled me. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. It's, <laughs> this is the end of it. Finished. See you later. I can't wait to tell my kids I was in the New York Times in 2012. Um, but then I was wrong. It wasn't done. The number one question people Google a lot is, mm -hmm. how do blogs make money? Mm -hmm. How do blogs make money? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> when I started Man Repeller, brands would email me and say either, we'd love to collaborate with you or do you sell advertising? And I was managing it on my own and just mm -hmm. you know pulling it out of my butt. <laughs> I, like Nasty Gal was our first advertiser and they were like, we'd love to run banner ads. And I was like, that will be $2,000, please. <laughs> For is that, I don't know how much money that is. is I was like, good? no. Okay. I was how much is a banner I was playing ad, business. Most people charge them based on a cost per impression or a cost per click. Okay. They don't just charge flat fees. I see. Okay. You know like when you're younger and you play bank? No, because no? I, I was busy literally sitting in a field drawing my horse. <laughs> okay. While you were playing bank, <laughs> I was like, oh, I wish that Pippi had pink hair. <laughs> So, we sold some banner ads, or I sold some banner ads, but not really. It was mostly collaborations with other brands. So I did, I made a trench coat with a brand called Griffin that's no longer in existence, but that was Because of your collaboration? Of Probably. Final nail in the coffin? Mm hmm So collaborations, um, appearances. Okay, ready guys? Action! Hi guys, it's me, Leandra, and today we're going to paint some happy clouds on my face. No, we're not. And everything is so different now with Instagram. So many of the blogs that were around when I started are no longer, they no longer really have a presence on desktop. Because they're just doing Instagram? On Instagram, yeah. How has that become an important part of people's I don't, business? Well, because it's a, that's a lot of influence, right? It's become a new form of media, Instagram. People charge as much as like $10,000 for a post. Mm. And they make that, and then they probably go to Celine and buy necklaces. You don't do those, though? No, we don't do that because our head of monetization really understood Man Repeller right off the bat, right. and that our metric of success was going to be measured in influence and quality versus actual quantity. Mm -hmm. And she has a very, very good sense of what works for us and what doesn't. So I've never actually had to put in place a strategy for her because her taste is just so on point. Were you always this confident or did you gain confidence through your site doing really well? Do you think I'm confident? You're, you're taking a risk, which I think some people are kind of intimidated by the idea of putting themselves out there even. Right. Well, 
I definitely trust my instinct. I, mm -hmm. I trust my gut, and I think I have good ideas. Yeah. Even though sometimes I, they're not good ideas. There's a difference in my mind between an entrepreneur and a smart business person. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm much more entrepreneurial than I am actually business savvy. Okay. You know, so I'm a very innovative thinker, and I'm I'm certainly ahead of what's going to happen right. in terms of media. But I freeze when the operational stuff comes up. Uh -huh. When it actually comes time to hire a new developer uh -huh. or look for an operations person, I'm just like, I can't do this. When you're interviewing for new people to join the team, what are you asking them about and how relevant is their degree or something that they've had work experience at uh, in terms of what you're looking for? For the more operational and tedious roles, that work experience is obviously really important. But mostly I like to get a sense of the people, like what do they do on weekends? How do they respond to situations? Like mm -hmm. when we're at restaurants, are they saying thank you to the waiter or waitress when they're coming by? That's always a pretty good way <laughs> to measure what kind of people they are. Sometimes you just get a really good feeling about someone when you sit down with them. Can you break down what some of the people in this office, for example, are doing? So we have a deputy editor, who's essentially my creative right hand. Then we have a photographer who shoots all of the original content. A managing editor who manages making sure that all of our contributors are hitting their deadlines. Then we have a social media director and a content strategist because you know, the home page on a website isn't really a home page anymore. Only like 15% of our traffic hits the home page. Most people are coming in sideways. Why? So from, from social media, and, uh, Twitter feed, the Facebook feed. Right. And then we have a sales team and they just work on bringing in the monies. What advice would you give anyone that's trying to start their own media company slash blog? Hmm. So the thing I say beyond be really niche, be streamlined, don't try to be something for everyone, just be everything for someone, is that even beyond actually coming up with your concept, it's really important to remain vulnerable because you're, you're very, very honest with yourself when you're feeling vulnerable. And the sort of like self-awareness that comes out of that vulnerability is often very, very helpful in your decision-making process. Mm. So be vulnerable, remember where your priorities are, and keep that in mind. That's lovely. And open your legs. <laughs> yeah. I really found it inspiring to talk to Leandra. I immediately sort of took her advice and started telling my colleagues different ideas for how we could run our business. It's interesting to see how fashion is evolving and I think all these brands are turning into media companies in their own right because they have to. And the shopping experience is far beyond brick and mortar at this point. It's like that might be the flagship and there's justification for having those shops, like opening ceremony, which has turned into basically a storytelling experience. But that's not the be all and end all of the customer's interaction with your brand. Incorporating tech can actually provide your business with even more of a backbone. I think the takeaway thing from talking to all of those people has been that they managed to find the right partners in order to become successful. If you're not very good at the business side or logistics, then you should admit that and find someone that is and vice versa. There's plenty of jobs out there for you and you know they're very much needed. To people watching this, I hope that they are inspired to just explore, I think. I think the thing that we've learned from this series and the last is that there's so many benefits to doing internships in a number of different career options because all of that will feed in one day to just knowing more about your craft. And you know, take someone like Brian Phillips who was working at a magazine and doing editorial and had a huge interest in art and then he's parlayed that into a fantastic business model with Black Frame who provide that wonderful crossover. You know, stop feeling like there's a limited pool of things you can do, because if something's oversaturated, then why not be entrepreneurial and make up your own thing? You don't have to always follow the crowd, and actually the world would benefit from more creative, exciting things. Well, I ran out of steam. I'm tired, leave me alone. We talked to so many people. So now I'm gonna nap and dream of fashion, as per usual. And that's it. Another series of The Future of Fashion draws to an end. 
I'm off to continue my quest for world domination and bigger sleeves. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for recommending this to your friends. Thank you. And as ever, subscribe to the British Vogue YouTube channel where I will see you soon. Bye. Put your comments in the box. I'm gonna go down the stairs now. <laughs>